Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, I want to read a story to you before I get into my subject this morning. I want to talk to you about as a man thinketh. I was thinking this morning, I, I switched on the TV while I was dressing, and a man was on TV, and he was speaking to his church, quite a big church, and he was screaming, and he was jumping, and he was perspiring. <laughs> and God says! And I thought, but why should you scream like that at the church? Because he was telling them what the devil's doing, and what the devil's not doing, and what God's doing. I said, that's unintelligent. Amen. Now, come on now. That's unintelligent. Because the church are sanctified people. You are saved. You're past that level now. You can preach like that in a campaign. In a crusade. Where people are listening to the gospel for the very first time. Christians must be spoken to as intelligent beings. We've got to communicate with you soundly and precisely the word of God. We must be able to handle it skillfully and present it to you in such a way that it will answer questions and you will be able to teach others. Amen? So that means you must become an intelligent Christian. If you find, if you find a Jehovah's Witness and you know have, who's come across a Jehovah's Witness? If you give them an opportunity to speak to you, you'll almost want to convert yourself. <laughs> because they are trained in such a way as to almost persuade you to believe what you are believing in is wrong. But if you come across a charismatic Christian, most times they're not, you find that the charismatic Christian can say, hey, I just know God. Hey, I just know God. That's it. But he can't explain his faith. He can't give somebody a reason, a basis of why he believes what he believes. In other words, he can't explain salvation. He can't explain the Trinity. He can't explain the Godhead. He cannot explain the, 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 the Calvary. He cannot explain redemption. He cannot explain sanctification. Are you with me? And I'm just saying that we as a church have to get there. In other words, where you become students of the word. Where you become intelligent in your belief. Where that you can take the word of God and apply it skillfully to life's issues. Because after church is finished, okay, let me say it like this because I'm trying to, I'm trying to get you to think in a certain way. And that the only way I can do it is explain it. See, if we just have inspiration all the time, jumping and screaming, which is good, but if we have inspiration all the time, when you check out of here, when you walk out the door, and when you're living life to its fullest, where all the pressure comes against you, there's no inspiration out there. So what are you going to do? The only thing that's going to sustain you is a solid foundation. Come on here, somebody. It's a solid foundation. It is an intelligent way that you will handle the word of God against the affairs and pressures of life. Are you with me? So you must become students of the word. You must become intelligent Christians. It's like I, I say sometimes, people pray. And so they will be praying and praying and praying and praying. If you had to stop one of them and say, what are you asking God for? I don't know. It's like almost going into a supermarket with no grocery list. You'll be pushing the trolley, aisle number 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, aisle number 10 again. So here comes the manager of the store. What are you looking for? Can I help you, sir? No, I'm just shopping. Well, what are you shopping for? Anything. You'll be pushing that trolley the whole day, nine to five, till the store closes and you wouldn't have done your shopping. So I'm just saying to you, and I'm, I'm, I'm submitting to you, that there's an intelligent way to handle the gospel and your belief system. So tell your neighbor, you are very intelligent. Hallelujah. In the things of God. 
In other words, I want to make you skillful. Amen. Amen. Skillful. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. All right. Now, I want to read you the story and then I want to speak to you about as a man thinketh. That's my title of the message, as a man thinketh. Now, someone sent this via email to me on the 4th of March, 2009. That person is here. I know who it is. And you thought I've forgotten about it, but I have read it. It says, several years ago, a preacher from out of state accepted a call to a church in Houston, Texas. Some weeks after he arrived, he had an occasion to ride the bus from his home to the downtown area. When he sat down, he discovered that the driver had accidentally given him a quarter too much change. As he considered what to do, he thought to himself, you better give the quarter back. It would be wrong to keep it. Then he thought, this is about thought, your thinking life. He says, oh, forget it. It's only a quarter. Who would worry about this little amount? Anyway, the bus company gets too much fare. They'll never miss it. Accept it as a gift from God and keep quiet. <laughs> this was the thought speaking to the man, the preacher. And when he stopped, came, he paused at the door. Then he handed the quarter to the driver and said, here, you gave me too much change. The driver with a smile replied, aren't you the new preacher in town? I've been thinking a lot lately about going somewhere to worship. I just wanted to see what you would do if I gave you too much change. I'll see your church on Sunday. <laughs> Did you get that? The bus driver tested the preacher and the preacher passed the test, but he had a battle in his mind. You got that? That's not finished. When the preacher stepped out of the bus, he literally grabbed hold of the nearest light pole, held on and said, Oh God, I'll nearly sell your son for a quarter. <laughs> Our lives are the only Bible some people will ever read. This is a really scary example of how much people watch us as Christians and will put us to the test. Always be on your guard. And remember, you carry the name of Jesus Christ on your shoulders when you call yourself a Christian. Watch your thoughts. You can write that down if you're taking notes. That's nice. Watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. And watch your character, they become your destiny. You got that? I went a bit fast. All right, can I go through it again? It says, watch your thoughts, they become what? Your thoughts become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Watch your character, they become your destiny. All right, did you enjoy that? I trust that you will remember that. Now, I want to take you to Proverbs, the 23rd chapter, verse number 7. Now, we're going to handle the Word of God intelligently, right? Say amen to that. Amen. All right. Scripture upon Scripture, precept upon precept, so that you can get something, get some understanding. The Bible says, with all you're getting what? Get understanding. And Proverbs 23, verse 7, the Bible says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so was he. You should be familiar with that scripture because I have mentioned it many times. It says, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so was he. All right, did you find that scripture? Would you read it with me? Let's, let's read it all together. One, two, three, go. All right, let's try that again. One, two, three, go. And the scripture reference. One more time. The scripture reference. You won't forget that. All right. Then I want you to turn again to 3 John 2. The epistle of John. 3 John. And verse number 2. Bless you. 3 John 2. You got that? When you found it, let's read together. One, two, three, go. Beloved, I pray 
that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. No, don't, don't be quiet. Read it because I'm reading from an NIV. You're reading it from King James. So it's okay. Let's read it again. One, two, three, go. Beloved, above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Now that is a very important scripture because your prosperity is attached vitally to your thinking again. Now I'm, I'm driving, I'm coming, I'm getting to a point now. That means you will only prosper to the measure how you think. You're not going to get an exterior manifestation without an interior or an internal adjustment. Are you with me? All right, so it says here in the, in the NIV translations, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper and, be, and uh, prosper in all things and be in health even as your soul, that means your mind, your intellect will prosper. That means God expects you to prosper according to the word of God. The Bible actually tells us in Timothy, it says, study to show yourself approved. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That means you must be able to understand. Now, let me explain something here quickly to you. I wish I, I wish I have time now to complete this message. If I don't, we'll, we'll pick it up next Sunday. Let's, let's take in the book, in the Old Testament, you remember how it was said that an evil spirit from the Lord, the Bible actually says an evil spirit from the Lord uh, went forth and vexed Saul. You remember that? Then elsewhere, I think uh, there was a time where God's, God the Bible says that God sent evil on them. All right. Now, remember that the Bible was not originally in the English form. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament in the Greek. And the Bible at some point in time was translated into the English language. King James, actually, the king of England, had asked the people to translate the um, Bible from the original text into English. Now, they did a good job, but however, there are some places they didn't really do a fine job. Uh, I don't know if you, you, you know what I'm saying. So, for example, you find that when they came into places like the scriptures or the examples that I just mentioned to you, they brought it in the causative sense, tense rather, in other words, it says an evil spirit from the Lord. But rather it should have read the Lord permitted an evil spirit to vex Saul. Because God is not evil and God will not bring evil on anybody. In other words, the Bible says he that breaketh a hedge, a serpent will bite him. That's in the book of Job. That means you break your hedge of protection by your disobedience and God will remove his covering and then an evil spirit will... All right? So God is not evil. God is love. Amen. In him there's no evil. Amen. Are you with me? So, so you've got to understand these basic things of Scripture. Otherwise, you'll take a Scripture and will not understand it. All right? So here in Proverbs 23, 7, it says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Then 3 John 2, says, Beloved, I wish above all things, so I pray that you may prosper in all things... And be in health even as your soul prospers. So God wants your soul to prosper. He wants you to have a sharp mind when it comes to the things of God. Amen. Say amen. amen. All right. Let me give you one more scripture. Philippians 4 verse 8. All right. Let me give you this one first. Ephesians 3 verse 20. Turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. It says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly, Above all that we ask or think, according to what? According to the power that worketh in us. All right, we're going to read it all together now. One, two, three. There, let's go. Now, unto him, able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Now, important words now. I want you to take note 
of the word ask in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. The word ask. It says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly what? Abundantly. Above all that we ask. That means God can do exceedingly abundantly or he will give to you according to what you ask. Right? Yes? You agree with that? That means if you ask God for something, God will not only give you what you ask, but he'll give you exceedingly abundantly more than you ask. Yes. But now watch the next word, think. He says, now unto him that is able to exceedingly, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, or think. Now, how many know what you think is what you get? So it brings me back to my point is that what you think is important because not only what you're asking for, you will get what you think you will get. Yes, think poverty, poverty will come. Think sickness, sickness will come. Think fighting, fighting will come. <laughs> you, you, I did. Think poverty minded, poverty will come. Think food, Food will come. Hallelujah. And some people can't say, I rebuke you. They say, God had given blessing. <laughs> you, 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 but you understand, you get the analogy. Now that scripture is important, but we've never seen it in the light that I'm bringing it now. So there's two things that you do, is that you ask God and you think about something. Both will bring you the measure with what you ask and what you think. However, God's word in this scripture says that God will give you exceedingly abundantly more than you ask. So, let's say for example, you ask God for prosperity in your life. What is God going to give to you? He's going to give you not only prosperity, but more than you have. But now think now. Let's say you were thinking poverty. You're going to get an abundant measure of poverty. So your thinking is important. Tell your neighbor, your thinking is important. Now you can come to church and say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. But if your thinking stinks, you're in trouble. Because you're going to get delivered to you what you've been thinking about, what you're meditating. That's why it's so important for us to meditate on the word of God all the time. Are you with me? Say amen, somebody. All right. Now, that word think means to consider. That means you should be considering God's word in your mind. You've got to exercise your mind to comprehend. That means all the time you're exercising your mind and you're thinking about God's word and how God's word is going to move for me. You, you, now I know some of you are lost now because you just think about other stuff. But I'm talking about those that are spiritually minded. To be carnally minded is death. Yes, to be spiritually minded is what? Life. Hallelujah. All right. Now it says, uh, think means to consider, to exercise the mind, to comprehend and to understand. You've got to understand God's will for you. You've got to understand God's word, his love letters to you. You've got to understand what God by his spirit is working in your life. God means everything for good, not for evil. Hallelujah. Say amen to that. Amen. God is always working on your behalf. He's always watching over you. You may not feel it sometimes, but God's got your back covered. That's his will. Think about that. Beloved, I wish that you prosper. That's his will towards us. That's his word towards us. Beloved, I wish that you prosper. And be in health, even as your soul prospers. Now, turn to Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 8. Are you getting something? Now, in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, it says, Finally, brethren... He says, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are of a bad report, whatsoever things are of strife, and discord, minding other people's business, checking what's cooking in their pots, doesn't say that. It says, finally, brethren, talking to you individually, it says, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, 
Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I frankly have trained myself now, I don't care what happens anyway. Now, do I love people? Yes, I, I do love people, right? Amen? I do love people, right? But the issue is that I, I'm not going around like a busybody looking what's going on everywhere. Because I got enough challenges of my own. And if you read yesterday's devotional, have you read it? How many of you read yesterday's devotional? It was powerful. Some of you didn't read it. Say, ouch. Then I know you didn't read it. It says, assess yourself. And the scripture that I quote here is 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. It says, examine yourselves. It didn't say, examine your neighbor. Examine your auntie. Examine your relative. It says, examine yourself. Whether he be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, but that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. And then I share with you how you should be thinking and how you should examine yourself. How many read it? All right. Praise the Lord for that. The rest of you, the, Lord's, the Lord forgive you. <laughs> examine yourself. So it says here, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Now watch verse 9. It says, those things which you have both learned and received, both that you have learned, that you have received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. See when God's peace come upon you, if you do those things. You see that? Come on, did you get what I said? Say, I say the God of peace is with me. All right, let's all read the scripture now then from Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Juan, let's show off verse number 8. One, two, three, go. Go. on these things now God's word tells you what to think on say hallelujah. hallelujah listen that guy with the yellow jersey there just shake him don't sleep in the service I have not come into God's house to sleep all right if your neighbor sleeps jerk them might just be a demon putting him off to sleep say hallelujah, hallelujah. you've got to be wide awake because if you sleep you will not get, and, and sometimes the devil wants you to sleep because he doesn't want you to get God's word. Say amen to that. Amen. All right. So finally, my brethren, think on these things. What things? Things that are pure, things that are lovely, and of a good report. Now, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. I know I'm just laying a foundation, but we'll get to the good part just now. All right. These are beautiful scriptures. Write them down, underline them in your Bible, and read them. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. After I read this scripture, I'm going to make a statement and then I'm going to take you on a journey. All right? You ready for it? All right. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. Say, I'm receiving something. I'm receiving something. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child I thought as a child but when I became a man I put away childish things all right that that is that is a double gender so it includes male and female all right doesn't leave females out because this is humanity it's men it says when I was a child the Greek word for child is nepios and nepios actually means immature it means when I was a child when I was nepios immature an immature Christian, an infant, and minor, simple-minded, like one of these children here. When I was a child, I spake as a child. 
I understood as a child, the Greek word for the word understood is proneo in the Greek. It means to exercise the mind, to be intensely interested, go in a particular direction. That means when you want understanding, you've got to be intensely interested. Like in church, you should be Bible open, notepad, pen, I'm in the Word. All right, you got that? And then it says, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, a thought, let's take the word thought. That word thought comes from the Greek word logizomai, which means to take inventory. That means when you use the word thought, it means to take inventory, to conclude, to reason, and to estimate. In other words, to take stock. Say amen. And then it says, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. The word man actually comes from a Greek word, but similar to a, 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 an Indian word. It's ane, which means A-N-E-R, which actually means, and you know what that means. In the Indian language, it means brother. But in the Greek language, it means sir, a man or a sir. In other words, a person that has come into maturity. Are you with me? Say, I'm a man. All right. Even the ladies can say that because it didn't mean man or female as in the female gender. It means I'm full grown, I'm mature. Say hallelujah. Now, I want to make a statement. You're ready for this. Don't sleep now. Tell your neighbor, don't sleep. All right. Let me make a statement. Here's my statement. Men are anxious to improve their circumstances, but are unwilling to improve themselves. They therefore remain bound. Did you get that? Men are anxious to improve their circumstances. Shall I maybe change it? Christians are anxious to change their circumstances, but are unwilling to change their mind or their thought life. Therefore, they remain bound. The key, therefore, is to change the way you think so that you can have the manifestations you desire. But before you have the manifestations that you desire, you must have the manifestation internally set in your heart and in your spirit. So that whatever you have on the inside, you will see on the... See, if you're afraid all the time when you're driving, you're afraid that you'll get hijacked, you will get hijacked. Doesn't matter you're a Christian. And doesn't matter you're pleading the blood. But if you're pleading the blood while you're operating in fear, it's not going to work for you. You've got to be operating in faith and then pleading the blood. Are you with me? Amen. So that means you've got to walk in boldness. So in other words, the key is, if you really want to change your life, how do you have to change? You change your thinking. You got that? Did you get something from that? It's important. Let me give you an example. Three examples I'll give you and then I want to do a demonstration. Three examples. Let's take a man who's poor and he wants to become prosperous. Now here's a man. He's very, very poor. I mean, he sits on a tomato box, doesn't have food to eat, doesn't have blades to even have a shave, doesn't have a bed to sleep on. He's sleeping on cardboard. He's really, really poor, but he wants to become prosperous. Now what he does is from the morning to the afternoon, all he does is sleep in the sun. And he drinks some whatever. Is he ever going to get prosperous? No. Why? A lazy man is not going to get prosperous. Yeah. Right. You got that. Let me give you another example. The other example is a rich man who has a very painful disease. Let's say he has gout. You know what God comes from? Can you help me now? Talk to me. What does God come from? What causes gout? Rich food. Am I right? Where's the nurse? Can you help me? All rich food. You know, plenty of meat. Butter chicken. White sauce. I mean, there's plenty of rich food. Now, here's a rich man. He has gout, but he doesn't want to stop eating healthy. He just wants to eat rich food. What's going to happen to him? Is that disease going to leave him? 
No. So what must he do? He has to train the way he thinks so that he can change his habits and his actions, right? Okay, let's take another man. Let's take a, the third example. A guy that employs a lot of people, but he's a crook. He crooks everybody in business. I mean, I'm sure you met somebody like that. He crooks everybody in business. He shortchanges his stuff. Doesn't want to pay them a reasonable wage. But he wants to be prosperous. You think he's going to prosper? No. Why? His thinking has not changed, so he didn't change his action. All right. So in other words, here's my question to you. If you want to change something on the outside, what do you have to change? As a man... Ah, you're getting it now. As a man thinketh in his heart. So if you want a better result on the outside, change your... If you change your thinking, you'll get a better result. So if you want to be prosperous, where must your thinking be? On prosperity. If you want to get well, where must your thinking be? On health. If you want to become rich, where must your thinking be? On how to get wealth. If you want to be an academic, where must your thinking be? On studying. So that you become an academic, right? Come on here, somebody. Your thinking is invariably, invariably going to drive you some way. Are you with me? Now, the only way to think right is to read right, study right. So your Bible must be an effective tool for you. So your Bible is just not a religious book that you go there sometimes, read for five minutes and expect to get a result. Your Bible is there to train you. Like the Proverbs, the book of Proverbs has got how many chapters in the book of Proverbs? 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. One chapter for every day. I promise you through the year, if you keep on reading the book of Proverbs, one chapter every, every day of every month and repeat it again and again, by the end of the year, you'll have understanding. Hallelujah. Come on here, somebody. All right, now I, I want to demonstrate something to you. All right, you're ready for this. I told you we're going to get to the good part now. You got to the academic part. What is this? Tape recorder. Now I was thinking about this last night when I was, I was preparing this here. There's some buttons here. This is a CD player and a tape recorder. It's got a stop button. Okay, let's start like this. You've got a play button. Play, say play. play. Then you've got a stop Rewind, Rewind. Pause. pause. How many buttons? Most of us live a four button life. Let me explain that. Most of us live a four button life. Four button life is we play. All the time we're playing. What do you mean you play, Pastor? Well, in the morning we get up, brush your teeth, have a shave, have a shower, go to work. You're playing. You're playing the game of life. Not that you're playing. You're working, but you're playing. Are you with me? Are you with me? You work the whole day. You're playing. You're having lunch. You're playing. You meet your friends. You're playing. You meet business associates. You're playing. You come home. So you press the play button. When you get home, you press the stop button. Because I need to rest. I'm tired now. So I press the stop button. I rest. All right, you're with me? Mm -hmm. And when you have a setback in life, you press the pause button. And so many people you meet today, they're on that pause button. I can't go forward and I can't go backwards and I can't go sideways. I'm on pause. What happened, brother? Things are bad. So-and-so took me in. They did something bad to me. So, I mean, so why don't you forgive them and move on? No, 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 no. Just leave me alone. Give me my space. <laughs> but, but why don't you come to church? Can't you see? It's some pause. <laughs> but take a step. Come. No, I'm on pause. And then the rewind. The rewind goes like this. When you have an argument with your wife. Or the wife has an argument with the husband. Rewind! Woo! You remember 1960. You remember, rewind. You remember 1972. 
You remember 1982? You remember the, you know, now they're talking about the mother and dad. Mom and dad's died, gone, buried, died. But you remember, you remember, you remember. <laughs> Play, stop, pause, rewind. It's a four button life. How many, how many button life? Four button life. As a man think it in his heart, so is he. But those are the four buttons we play. Play, stop, pause, rewind. rewind. Let's say it again. Play, stop, pause, Rewind. Play. Stop. Pause. And rewind. That's the life we live. We lead, we live all the time. And God says, no, no, no. That's enough. If I really want to get something great out of you, you can't live a four-button life. Because as a man thinks it in his heart, so is he. So what does it mean? Well, I, was, I, 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 I looked at the, my recorder, you know, the button here, the, 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 the remote control here. And I saw, look at the functions on this thing. It's more than stop, play, rewind, and pause. I was looking. Let me share some of you, the, some of the functions that's on here. There's a mute button, a power button, a multimedia button, a menu button. List, volume, arc, arc, text, time, mix, reveal, reveal. It's like revelation. God, reveal. There's a button here, reveal. See? And then it goes mode, index, hold. Size. God, give me a house. He says, size. Size. Where's that button? I only know. Play, stop, rewind, pause. There is a button there, but you've got to find it. And Lord, give me a house. Size. Don't know what size. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? And then update. Ooh, when last did we update ourselves? Update. Update. My God. Update. It means keep up with the time. It means do something fresh. God is fresh. You understand, God moves. God is always on the move. Think about this, and I'll, I'll share this with you. In, 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 when he walked with Israel, you remember, from, from Egypt, to the wilderness and to the promised land, the Bible says every time God moved, Israel had to follow the pillar of fire and the cloud. God moved, they moved. God moved, they moved. Look today, God moves, mm. God moves, mm. That's why some of us are stuck. That's true, that's why some of us are stuck. Because God is fresh. God is green, he's fresh. He's got an aroma. He's doing something every day. You've got to keep on updating yourself with God because he's doing something fresh. His words to you is fresh. His speech to you is fresh. His ideas to you is fresh. It's just that you're not in the place that he wants you to be. You, 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 you playing the game. You playing. Play. Come say it with me. Play. Not to forget eject. <laughs> Some people, when they're fed up, they just press the eject button, they're gone. Where are you, brother? No, I'm just somewhere, pastor. Why aren't you in church anymore? No, I've just ejected. <laughs> Make sure if you eject, you've got a parachute on. <laughs> are you with me? See, we're so, for, we're so busy with the four button life. Play, stop, rewind, pause that God has so many more functions, and it goes on, it's an update, angle, set, zoom, display, scan, <clears throat> mode, program, mark, step, enter, title, equalizer, random, all that on just one remote. Boy, I said you need a degree 
to understand all of this, but I mean, really, if I really want to understand how this VCR works or how this DVD player works, I've got to update myself. And so we have to update ourselves because knowledge and information is power. See, if you don't have knowledge and information, you can't do what the world is doing. And then you're wondering as Christians, why is the world doing things better than the church is doing? Because they're constantly updating and we're not. They're constantly checking and we're not. We're too afraid to ask. Even if you don't know, you can ask somebody who can teach you. Or you can ask somebody to show you. Come on here. And the young people are sharp with these things. But you see, the older people, they, they're too scared to ask the younger people because, well, I'm older, they're younger. Hey, listen, there's some things I can teach you and some things you can teach me. Learn everything you can learn. If I don't understand something about technology, I call these guys, come show me. And even if they don't want to show me, just make it work for me. I want this thing to work. Come on here, somebody. And so I'm saying to you, stop living the four-button life. As a man thinketh in his life, so was he. Start thinking bigger. Start thinking broader. Come on here, somebody. Be sharp. Come on, turn, turn to your neighbor. Say, be sharp. Think sharp. Be sharp. Get on, get on the bandwagon of technology. We're living on an information age. If you get on the internet, not the wrong sites now. There are some wrong sites there. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about good information. You can pick up virtually anything. Come on here, somebody. Get on there. Teach yourself. Get the information. Then apply the knowledge. And when you apply it and stop living the four-button life, boy, you'll be living on the edge. It means then you start walking as a Christian. You'll be fresh and you'll be green in your thinking. You'll be lifting up the ceiling. Some of you place the ceiling over your heads and that's, that's the ceiling. Some of you are just looking for bargains. No, it's the truth. Some of you are just looking for bargains. If you find something, then you just, okay, down the road. I mean, here it's five, five rands. There it's 4.99. But you will drive all that way down, spend 50 bucks on petrol to save. No, you're laughing, it's the truth. And some of you are Christians. Just bargain hunting because you imported that from Egypt, from the world, and brought it to the church. So we're always looking for bargains. Are you with me? We're always looking for, why don't you trust God that you'll get the money to pay for it? And you know what? I've learned something in life. Can I share this with you in closing? I remember when I was first married, this was many Diwalis ago, but I remember when I was first married, I used to look now, because you know, the man has to produce everything, the food, pay the bills, pay everything, and I used to buy the cheapest furniture you could get. But what I didn't know, it was made of chipboard. You know, chipboard. The headboard was chipboard. The dressing drawers were chipboard. The kitchen units were chipboard. I'd buy it, I mean, two ninety nine dollars specials. Bring it home and then place some water on it and then wow, it swells and then it breaks and it comes to nothing. My wife would say to me, why don't we buy something expensive? And I say, no. For years I said no until I changed my thinking. So after going through three, four sets of furniture, I realized cheap is not good. Tell your neighbor, cheap is not good. And then I started to realize in life that if you buy something of quality, it may cost you, but it will last you. Now we buy furniture of quality. There are some furniture that we bought. It's almost 20 years. Some are 15 years. It's still good as new. No more chipboard mentality. You see, but the thing is, I was buying chipboard because I was thinking chipboard. See, you won't go to a big expensive store and buy good socks, no. You would go and buy the cheap ones they're selling, the bobby on the street is selling cheap socks, you know, those nylon ones that don't absorb the perspiration. But you'll go to the chemist and pay a hundred rand for the cream because you've got athlete feet after that. <laughs> Doesn't make sense to me. Am I speaking the truth? What am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist that one. <laughs> if you buy good socks, it will last you. 
and it will, your feet will be all right. Now, I don't buy cheap socks. Are you with me? My feet are important. They take me wherever I have to go. I can't be hopping around with athlete's foot. <laughs> are you with me, guys? Stop thinking cheap. Tell your neighbor, stop thinking cheap. Stop thinking bargain hunting. Are you with me? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Why don't we do something and trust God? He will produce for us. Why don't we? Say amen. amen. I remember one time I was driving and all the hills, I just wait for a hill. See, some of you don't know. But from us guys who come from back in the day, we just wait for a downhill, not an uphill. And when you got downhill, you put it in neutral. You're coasting all the way down. Come on, how many of you still coast? <laughs> it's a mentality, brethren. I came from that school. And so you would save petrol, and then you would look at the mileage, and if you clocked a kilometer, you want to give yourself, ooh, you saved. Why don't we just drive and say, Lord, this petrol's going to take us. One time I was driving on the highway and then my petrol was quite low. But I, it's not that I didn't have the money to fill, but I couldn't get to a garage because the, when I entered, there was a garage. When I got on the highway, now there wasn't a garage now for 50 Ks. And my, my petrol needle was almost on empty. And then I laid my hand on the dashboard and I said, Lord, you know, I was driving a Jeep. So on the top there, it displays how many kilometers you can do with the existing petrol in your fuel tank. So... It was, it was showing me about 10 Ks. I could only do 10 Ks, but I needed to drive 30 for the next exit. So I placed my hand on the dashboard. I said, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I said, I need enough petrol to get me to the next garage. Immediately, I think it was showing 10 Ks, it shows 53 Ks. <laughs> it was God that increased it. And I drove all the way, I passed 50 Ks, got to a garage, and full petrol and the red light didn't come on. Can't God do it? Amen. Ask your neighbor, can't God do it for you? <laughs> Say, ooh. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> amen. I said, amen. amen. Stop storing all those KFC and Nando things in your drawers. <laughs> Keep it. Tomorrow might be a rainy day. Yes, you will get a rainy day if you keep on saving stuff like that. Now you've got to pay for the plastic. So now you, some of you got a plastic drawer at home. All the plastics. Are, if you open it, you know, if you open that drawer, plastic hits you. It's a plastic wall because you're saving all those bags. After you crumple it and you put it in the drawer like that, it's too embarrassing to even walk with that because it looks ugly now. But you see why God's not prospering you? Because you have a plastic mentality. You have a nylon socks mentality. You have a coasting my car mentality. I remember some time back, I was telling somebody, I said, we have two showers a day. I said, one shower in the morning and one shower in the evening. It was a grown woman. She turned around, she says, oh no, we don't have two showers in my home. I said, why not? She says, we're saving water. It's laughable, but it's true. It is true. You've got to change. Come on, say, Jesus, help me. No, no, I'm showing you. I'm showing you, brethren. Listen, I'm not trying to be, uh, I'm not trying to be uh, you know, demeaning or, 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 or that. I'm, I'm trying to show you that sometimes we're expecting a manifestation and a result. But you're not going to get big results if you're thinking small. You've got to think really big. You've got to think like God thinks. And God is a big God. And He thinks big. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. All right, I'm going to start thinking bigger now. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I say to you in Jesus' name, from today, your thinking has changed. I say to you from today that everything in your life has changed. I see millionaires in our church. I see you growing in the grace of God. 
Hallelujah. I see things working out for you. I see you are thinking big like God thinks big. You're going to dream big. You're going to stop living the four button life. Amen. You're going to live this type of life. Amen. Many buttons. Hallelujah. Say thank you Lord Jesus. Did you get something out of it? I know it came out funny. I didn't mean to say it like that. I tried to keep my composure. Please forgive me. But the issue is that you got the point. You know, I am naughty. I just couldn't resist that. <laughs> Hallelujah. The other day I was, I was having a meeting, a staff meeting at the church, and here came a person, I think, they were knocking the window, and they were selling socks. I said, oh no, not that sock. <laughs> Hallelujah. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Think big. Stop bargain hunting. If you pray and say, Lord, this year looks expensive. That's a coat I have. Let me trust you, Lord, that you'll give me the money. And God will give you the money. See, I remember one preacher said it like this. He said, I got angry with God one day. He said, he said there was another preacher who asked God for a million rand and God gave him a million rand. And he said, I asked God just for 100,000 rand and God didn't give me the 100,000 rand. He said, I got very upset and I went to God and I was complaining to God. And God said two things to the man. He said, number one, he said, that man had a plan. He said, you didn't have a plan. And then he said, that man believed me for the million. He said, though you are small, you didn't even believe that I'd give you that small amount. So you didn't get it. You'll only get what you believe for. So I want you to lift your hands and say, Lord, from today, I'm going to think bigger in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask bigger. Hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. You are big, right? I said you are big. Tell your neighbor you are big in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Did you get something? Do you still love me? Don't go home and now pick on me now. I'm trying to stretch you to think bigger. Say hallelujah. Next time you get a car, get a car with an aircon. Leather seats, electric windows. Maybe the devil stole your car. It's all right, let it go. A better one's coming. Say hallelujah. Amen. Say amen. Maybe you were renting and someone kicked you out the house. A better one's coming. God's bigger. Hallelujah. If he could do it for me, he's going to do it for you. If he did it for someone else in the church, he can do it for you. Hallelujah. You have a big God. Amen. Praise God.